Welcome everyone. My name is Sally Thurston from the Maynard Library, and it's nice to have such a, a, a great crowd tonight. Um, as uh, before, we get started. You you feel welcome to um, write in the chat where you're um, where you're joining us from, and um, we will be using the Q and A for questions tonight, um, which Jane will answer after the after the talk. Um, and you heard that we are recording. I'll send the recording out um, tomorrow or the next day. Um, um, special welcome to our friends from Wayland and Lincoln. Uh, this program is sponsored by the Lincoln Public Library, the Wayland Free Public Library, and the Maynard Public Library. And I'd like to thank all three friends groups for their support and to encourage you to support your friends groups in turn to bring you more programs like this. Um, two program notes from Maynard. Uh, we're sponsoring um, on Saturday, June 24th, a fix-it clinic, which um, is an opportunity for you to bring in things in your house that, um, that you haven't been able to repair, but maybe someone else can. If the idea is to keep things out of the landfill, um, I'll put a registration link in the chat. Um, and also our friends are having their book sale this Saturday uh, June 17th from 10 to 4. Um, I also encourage you to sign up for your library's newsletter if you don't already get it. Um, okay, we talked about that. Um, we have turned on transcription tonight, so you can um, use that function if you like it. Um, and now it's our very great pleasure to welcome Jane O'Neill of Culturally Curious tonight. Um, Jane has shared, shared her expertise with, with us in Maynard many times. We think possibly 11, <laughs> um, and she will return on June, uh, I'm sorry, on August 9th to talk about uh, Seaside Escapes, the art and architecture of the New England coast. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, Jane holds a master's degree in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University Graduate School of Education. Uh, she's worked at some of New Hampshire's uh, elite, uh, prestigious cultural institutions including the Courier Museum of Art, uh, where she held the role of senior educator. She's taught art history at the college level for many years now, um, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. Um, so in celebration of Pride Month, uh, Jane will be talking tonight about George Tooker, um, Modern Life and Magical Real Realism. This is not an artist that I'm familiar with, so I'm very excited to, um, to learn all about George Tooker. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, take myself out of the picture here and hand over to Jane. Thank you, Sally. And thank you for taking a, ch a chance on George Tucker for Sally and for everybody here tonight, because I'm assuming you don't know too much about him. You won't be disappointed. I think you'll really be enthralled with what you're going to see. We're going to get the opportunity to get to know George Tucker a little bit better tonight. He was a 20th century American artist and he created these remarkable, realistic, sort of surrealistic images. Um, some of them are about modern life, but all of them seem to have a somewhat timeless quality to them. So don't feel bad if you've never heard his name before. In my opinion, he is one of the best kept secrets in the history of art. And I think after this, you might go shouting his name from the rooftops. So this is a little preview of what's to come. We'll get back to this image in just a moment. Let me give you a sense in terms of how we'll spend this next hour together. We're going to get started with an introduction to George Tucker and a sense of what this magical realism is. We'll look at his probably most prestigious paintings that are known as his public paintings, his social commentary works. And then I have, I've just kind of grouped together because he would find these themes and just kind of stick with them. So I've grouped them together in um, loose association here. We've got windows and doors, light and love, sleep and death, and then we'll wrap up with his legacy. Now, this is one strange painting here on the, on, on the screen. And it's one that we're, we are unfortunately not going to go back to, but it is a haunting image isn't it? Even though it's called Festa, it's from 1948. And there's this woman with these seemingly black eyes who's welcoming, welcoming us into uh, what looks like a, a, a New York City sort of street fair here. So lots of big, big themes. They're, they're already right here. So let's get started with our introduction to the artist George Tucker. Okay, so we see him here as a young boy and a young man. 
George Tucker was born in 1920 in Brooklyn, New York, and he was raised Episcopalian. His faith comes into the picture a little bit later. Um, now, his mother was half Cuban, and that was really important to his identity. He sort of thought of himself as being mixed race, though, of course, he passed as white. But um, but he was very aware of, of races mixing, and that was something that he was oftentimes presenting in his body of work. Now, at the age of seven, he began taking painting classes. And even though he was from a solidly middle-class family, he ended up attending Phillips Academy in Andover and then going on to Harvard. And I think those experiences coming from the middle class and probably being exposed to the lives of, of a more privileged class made him sort of set within him at a young age a strong sense of the inequalities that exist in America. And that becomes a lifelong concern for him. And his artistic output is a way to sort of process that. So Tucker was a gay man, as Sally mentioned, and he was openly gay at a time in America where it was not um, not considered normal or even safe for somebody to be out. And his sexuality, um, the sense of being an outsider in society too, helped him to develop a strong sense of empathy in his art, and it often guided the subjects that he chose. Now, um, after he graduated from college, he went to New York City and he began studying painting at the Art Students League in New York City. He had several different instructors, but the artist Reginald Marsh, whose work you see over here on the left, probably had the biggest impact on George Tucker. Uh, Marsh was a social realist painter. And so he was really concerned with like the uh, capturing the, the gritty scenes of life, real modern life in New York City. And so there tends to be a real hustle and bustle in Reg Reginald Marsh's paintings. Like we see over here, all these people exiting the subway, you get this terrific sense of movement and energy. You have all the details of the women's dresses. You get the details of the newspaper over here. And on the right, here is a sketch from young George Tucker. He's 24 years old, and you feel like he's taking a page right out of his um, out of his instructor's uh, uh, playbook. He's uh, capturing modern life. He's getting the, all of the details down here. We'll see how he absorbs some of these lessons and then sort of leaves some of them behind. Because for George Tucker, the people who were probably most influential on his artistic development were his friends, his contemporaries. So in this case, we're looking at two works by um, um, by men who were actually both uh, George Tucker's lovers at various points in his life. This over here on the left is a painting by an artist named Paul Cadmus, and it's called The Fleet's Inn from 1934. And then over here on the right is a painting by William Christopher, and it's called Red Interior from 1960. So Tucker and Cadmus dated for about five years. And, and I think you can sort of see, you'll see, I think, this how these kind of solid uh, really almost massive figures. He absorbs this lesson from Cadmus, and um, and and uh, there's a sense of of a sort of static quality to these works more so than than what we saw with his uh, painting instructor Reginald Marsh. So there's a sense that that you would sort of stylize these figures, but then also kind of repeat them again and again too. We'll see that nearly identical figures crop up quite a bit in um, in the modern world that George Tucker paints. Now, I mentioned he dated both of the artists represented here, but it was William Christopher who was really the love of his life. And this is George Tucker over here with William Christopher. Um, they got together in the mid 1950s and uh, they met in New York City and they were they stayed together until William Christopher's death in 1973. And after William Christopher died, George Tucker essentially lived a, a, life, a life almost of isolation and didn't seek out any more romantic relationships. So when it comes to George Tucker's artwork, it's sometimes said that his paintings are implicitly homosexual, not explicitly. One of his very early paintings called Children and Spastics, this is from 1946, is said to be his most direct commentary on um, homosexuality. So what we see here are five children. Yes, there's five of them. They're dressed in black. They've got these long brooms uh, that almost look spear-like, right? They look like they're, they're dressed for war in some ways. And they are confronting 
these grown men that are termed as spastics in the title of the painting. But these grown men are, are very pale, their arms are exposed, they seem vulnerable in comparison to these uh, children dressed in black. But it's their mannerisms here that were stereotypical mannerisms for homosexuals at the time that I think draw most people to, to uh, uh, or lead most people to draw the association between um, uh, homosexuality and, and the way that uh, society at large treated people who were homosexual. So this is really an early example of how Tucker's life and his experiences inform the content of his work. And this brings us to his remarkable self-portrait from 1947. He was only about 27 years old when he painted this, which is just amazing. It's a round painting. It's in this kind of Tondo format here, and it's roughly 16 inches across. So it's almost as though you're looking in a mirror. George Tucker has shaved his hair down really close to um, his skull. And we have this repetition of this circular form in his head and his eyeballs with the Nautilus here, even with the architectural detail just behind him, uh, perhaps even in the knot of his sweater. Notice that he's wearing a sweater wrapped around his neck unnecessarily because he's already wearing a sweater. It's a really striking image. And it's, um, and it's all about reinforcing these basic geometries that are organizing the image. Uh, he's said to sort of look like a monk here too with that extra sweater wrapped around his shoulder. And it certainly helps to accentuate the volume of his neck and how it's supporting this head here. Now, just to give you a sense in terms of how spot on this is, here is a photograph of the artist from around the same time. So his ability to paint a realistic painting is really quite striking for such a young man, for anyone really. But it's worth noting too, that this is pretty out of sync with what is happening in the art world in New York City at this time. We have, of course, an example of Jackson Pollock's painting from the same year. This is called um, Full Fathom Five. And, um, and there's this notion that George Tucker and other figurative artists were kind of left behind because the art world was swinging towards the avant-garde and um, non-objective art like Jackson Pollock's. Tucker didn't care that he never became famous. He was never really interested in like celebrity status and um, or the, the New York scene in general. Now, I want to share with you a little bit about how George Tucker would make these paintings because most artists that you see, especially modern artists, are working with oils, but he was using this completely anachronistic method called egg tempera painting. So we've all probably used tempera paints at some point to paint a poster, but egg tempera means that you're actually mixing egg yolk in with pigments and you have to sort of thin it out and you have to work continuously so that it doesn't dry up. This is actually his painting of an egg carton from 1960. So, um, so what you can achieve using egg tempera is, um, is, is this real kind of precision, but it comes out with these thin, faint strokes. It's hard to get a real saturated color with egg yolk tempera painting. And when I call it an anachronistic process, it's because it's a, a painting medium that was used back before the Renaissance even. So here's Bot uh, just the detail, Botticelli's uh, Venus from the birth of Venus. And I think George Tucker's nod to that Venus, uh, sort of a similar pose, the girl with the basket. Um, so we get the sense that uh, Tucker is somebody who knew his art history, but he was also working in this medium that helped to develop figures that have this same almost sort of statue-like stance in so many of his pictures. And that's because it takes a long time to develop these pictures. There's so many brushstrokes that go into making. A, a te a, an egg tempera painting. Now, in addition to using egg tempera, he was also he also had a very sort of laborious uh, process in terms of developing the images themselves. He would make extensive uh, sketches, like the one that you see over here for a painting called The Bird Watchers from 1948. He's really sort of um, organizing how he is formally composing an image like this. And then he would essentially lay a grid across the, the sketch so that he could transfer it for, uh, uh, square by square onto the canvas. And he would work so slowly. It would take him months and months and months to finish a painting. Um, sometimes he would only paint 
three pictures a, a year. So his artistic output is, is not that great in terms of numbers. Now, uh, when we look at the self-portrait over here on, on the left, we can see something that looks kind of casual, informal, but then you begin to see all of these organizing compositional lines, um, that there's this great triangle right here at the center here. Oh, look, there's another triangle here in the upper corner. There's always some sort of measurement, some sort of organizational principle, some sort of geometry that organizes his paintings. So that's one really fun thing to look at. Now, back to Tucker's life for just one second. Beginning in 1957, he and his partner, William Christopher, start spending weekends up in Vermont. Eventually, they move there full time in 1960, as William Christopher has a position at Dartmouth College. So this the sense of a quiet, peaceful life of solitude really fit to them both, and they, they just loved it there. And um, despite that, they were very much engaged with what was happening in the world, what was happening with the civil rights movement. They joined the NAACP at Dartmouth. Apparently it was all white students because there wasn't a great deal of diversity, but they actually traveled down to Alabama to take uh, part in one of the marches from Selma to Montgomery. And they were there with Dr. Martin Luther King. So um, they were very passionate about these issues and they, we see it sort of coming into his work, uh, perhaps even in this very mysterious work called Dark Angel, another self-portrait. This one, he's got these heavy lidded sort of tired eyes and the artist's head is kind of compressed between these two hands here. One of them, his own with his paintbrush kind of resting um, on his uh, chin. And then the other hand of this androgynous angel um, who looks African-American, but still has wings and, and sort of a halo effect here. And you have to sort of wonder what is the nature of, of this relationship between these two figures is, is this angel guiding? Is this angel inspiring? Or is this angel sort of controlling? Tucker leaves all of this up to us to decide. So as we finish up our look into the artist's life, um, I will just share that his partner, William Christopher, died in 1973. And just a few years later, Tucker, who was Episcopalian, converts to Catholicism and then begins to go to mass every single day. It becomes a huge part of his spiritual life. And he, like I said, essentially lives this life of solitude in his Vermont home. Um, so he continues to paint. He continues to sketch every single day. And he's working right up until his own death in 2011. So I just want to touch on this notion of magical realism before we move on. And I have these two examples of Tucker's work on the screen. On the left, it's called Red Carpet. And on the right, we have Sleepers One. So we have this kind of dichotomy of, of watchfulness, wakefulness, and then rest and unconsciousness on the other side. And I'm just sort of tickled at how well these two images complement each other. It's like a study of opposites. So Tucker's paintings almost always seem like they're set in the modern world. There's usually some sort of um, element to the clothing or the architecture that speaks to our lived experience, but it never gets too specific. And so that allows him to maintain the sense of timelessness when it comes to these pictures. Now, what gives these paintings a touch of magical realism or even surrealism? First, it's this idea that he's painting in this very realistic style. In some cases, it's almost photorealistic or hyper-realistic, but he is careful, once again, not to get too specific. So we see with both of these images, he's including multiple figures, of, uh, multiple versions of the same figure again and again. Um, and that is a, a, a motif that he uses to sometimes suggest uh, that these figures are, are one and, and, and separate simultaneously. So he also, with these pictures, is painstakingly avoiding narrative. These are really ambiguous scenes. He's leaving it up to us um, as to why these women are sitting on the carpet with their backs to each other, looking so anxious and smoking. We don't know why. We don't know if these men have been um, in a shipwreck or up all night at a wild beach party. We don't know why they're sleeping on the beach. So um, we're going to fill in the blanks tonight. George Tucker has a lot in store for us. So let's turn our attention to his social commentary paintings. And these, again, are really the works that most people know best. Um, and these are, this is like a series of works that he did beginning in the 1950s, sometimes called his public pictures. So this is a work called Government Bureau. It's from 1956, and it's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. 
And we're in this administrative space stacked by these identical looking, very foreboding men with these cold, with cold white flesh and these sort of dark eyes. Uh, uh, they sit behind frosted glass and we can only see their eyes and occasionally an ear. And we can see their hands on these uh, machines or counting machines just underneath the glass. And we sense not only the bleakness of their roles, but the even bleaker experience of all of the people who are waiting there to be seen, to the people who are waiting for these people to help them out. Notice how almost all of these figures look identical. It's like copy, paste, <laughs> copy, paste. So not surprisingly, the, the inspiration for this image came directly from the artist's experience. He was trying to renovate a brownstone that he and William Christopher had moved into, and here he is negotiating all the red tape um, uh, and regulation that went into like the permitting of this re renovation, and it resulted in weeks upon weeks of just headaches and frustration. So we've all been there, right? We've all been waiting at the DMV before or in like the security line at the airport. Um, it's a, one of those moments where you're not a person, but you're a number, you're a document that needs to be processed. And this is a distinctly modern experience. For George Tucker, this represented the misuse of authority without responsibility. So he really had a great deal of disdain for these people sitting behind the frosted glass. Now let's take a look at probably his best known painting. It's called The Subway, painted in 1950. Um, I believe this is at the, the Whitney Museum of Art. It, it is, once again, a familiar scene to us. It's something we've experienced. We've all been in a space like this at some point in our lives, whether it's in like a parking garage or in the subway itself. So here, George Tooker is capturing this very unique modern experience of being in this subterranean labyrinth underneath a city, being surrounded by these kind of sour, soulless faces of strangers. The subway being underground has this way of kind of breaking down societal connections that exist above ground. Nobody looks at each other, can't make eye contact, right? There are no pleasantries here. Uh, people go about their business and you stick to yourself. You feel alone in the crowd. And Tucker emphasizes this by this kind of dehumanizing architecture that just serves to separate people. Um, notice these men in these niches, which are probably telephone niches, but everybody is sort of cordoned off from each other. And he emphasizes this architecture by actually using three different um, vanishing points in this picture. So it's another picture that's really complicated in terms of its organization. So none of these passageways seem to really go anywhere either, right? There's no escape from this. There isn't even a train in sight here. There's just all of this anxiety, particularly because we're supposed to connect with this woman in red in the foreground, who's actually kind of holding herself in this moment of fear. George Tucker, not surprisingly, said, I didn't like the subway. I think it's obvious I didn't like a lot of things about living in the city. Now, I want to share with you just one detail here that has always haunted me um, going back years. If we zoom in right over here, there's this tiny woman in the background also wearing red. She seems to be sort of crouching up against the wall there. She's got a stole around her shoulders and seemingly like a crown. What is she doing back there in this place where nobody spends too much time? Nobody dwells in the, sub in the subway. I always felt like she was the queen of the underworld here. I also want to share with you um, just an example of the kinds of paintings that were inspiring George Tucker to create an image like this. He was looking back at early Renaissance paintings. This is one by the artist Piero della Francesca. And you can see how uh, Francesca has, um, also kind of divided the space in order to tell a story. You've got these very large figures in the foreground uh, 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 and then this perspective that leads our eye back into the great distance. Uh, and you also get this sense in terms of permanence. There's not a lot of movement in, um, in, in this early Renaissance painting, just as there isn't movement in Tucker's painting. But if you compare it to the work of his, of his uh, master, of his instructor at the Art Students League, that was all about movement. We all know what it's like when the subway doors open and people come flooding out. 
George Tucker wasn't interested in capturing like those details of modern life. It was the feeling, the, the emotional experience of being in the subway. So one last great reference here. Um, back in 2016, there was an artist whose name is Paul Vandekar, who did a whole series of photographs asking his friends to recreate this painting in New York City subway, um, just to uh, tap into the fact that this is an image that still very much resonates, even though it's what, 70 years old at this point. So if we continue on with Tucker's public images here, this is an image called The Waiting Room from 1959. It's at the Smithsonian. And once again, we see a particularly uh, 20th century brand of anxiety and alienation. We have no idea what these people are waiting for, but it, they're waiting a long time, right? We even see that these numbered stalls go past 100. So how big is this room? Um, why do they need the privacy of these individual stalls? What is happening here? Tucker doesn't really show us people's faces. We get exhaustion, we get resignation, um, but the one face we do see is this kind of garish smile on the back of this magazine. It's this horrible grimace in this unhappy space. So for George Tucker, a place like this was purgatory. purgatory. It was people who are waiting to live their lives, waiting to wait more, you know? So um, so this was, you know, part of the modern experience. It's still relatable today, I think, and still very haunting. So he takes this theme and he sort of runs with it. This is a picture called Landscape with Figures, and it's from 1966. Have you ever worked in an office cubicle before? Because you probably could relate with this, to this picture. We just see this endless sea of boxes with um, just the tops of people's heads um, coming up out of them. Some people are looking straight forward. Some people look like they're kind of asleep. And then we have these two figures that look like they've just had this sense of, of awareness, this sense of epiphany, and they might even be awakening to this condition here. Now, you'll never believe this, but in 1968, a huge steel manufacturing company got in touch with George Tucker, and they said, can we use this painting as a um, as a way to recruit new employees for our marketing. And George Tucker was like, not only do you not understand this picture, but you know, I'm against the military industrial complex. So we're not going to do that. But it's pretty remarkable to think that anybody would use this for employee recruitment. Now, if this is hell to work in, this would be the break room in hell, right? This is called Lunch. It's from 1964. And we have all of these people in these compressed ro um, rows here eating at these very narrow tables or counters. Um, their heads are bent, their eyes are downcast. We think of meals as an opportunity to talk and engage and to connect. This is not a place of connect connection. These are people who are carefully ignoring each other. Now, if we go beyond that just kind of surface level reading of the work, I think it's important to note that like the only full face that you see in this picture is the face of an African-American man. And this is a picture from 1964. This is a picture where the very issue of, um, well, I should say this picture was painted at a time where the very issue of a Black person eating at a lunch counter was still highly charged in this country, especially in the South. So this is George Tucker making a political statement in a picture that other, otherwise seems pretty surreal. I mean, connected to our lived experience, but so far beyond it. And we see uh, Tucker being political one more time in this, the last picture in this section. Um, this is a picture uh, called Supper from 1963. And it's another image that really has to do with his engagement with equality and civil rights. So what we see here is a black man, another black man who is uh, getting ready to uh, have a meal. And he's flanked by these two white men. He's holding this loaf of bread. The black man is at the center of the picture. He's clearly the protagonist. And he looks out at us with this kind of sense of solemnity. Now, what George Tucker is doing is he's quoting religious paintings here, specifically the story of the supper at Emmaus, which um, took place after uh, Christ was crucified. So he's already dead, but he's been resurrected and he comes back incognito in a way that his apostles, his own disciples, don't recognize him at this supper until he breaks the bread. So George Tucker is actually presenting us Jesus 
as a black man in the 1960s. This was actually his, um, he, well, I should say he was inspired to do this by Dr. Martin Luther King, who he felt was this enlightened, peace-loving person as much as, as Jesus was. So um, certainly there weren't a lot of pictures like this being made in the 1960s by white male artists. All right, so let's turn our attention to sort of a lighter subject here. This is called, this is a section called Doors and Windows. Um, these would all be considered George Tucker's private pictures as opposed to his public commentary ones. And he, what we'll see is that he returns to themes again and again, but it's pretty rare for him to make one window painting and then follow it up next with another window painting. What we'll see is that sometimes he goes back to a theme, sometimes decades later. Okay. So we're gonna start with this image here, which is called Gypsy from 1951. He created this picture shortly after he had moved in New York City. He was living on West 18th Street and he, to get home, he passed by all of these shop fronts where the, um, there were gypsy women who were um, doing fortune telling. And so he was loosely inspired by the experience of seeing these women, but this isn't a direct representation of, of his experience. So what we see here is a woman in a chair with her feet up, her arms crossed. She looks a little bit bored, um, maybe a little bit weary at the end of the day. Her eyes are, are cast down here. And there's this orange curtain behind her that is sort of glowing. We know that there's a light source back there, but we don't know what it is. And we can see the silhouette, the faint silhouette of a man who's standing in profile just behind her. We don't, behind that curtain really. We don't know what the relationship is or, or really what's going to happen next. Now, George Tucker is very consciously quoting the history of art here with this reclining woman, going back to Jacques-Louis David in the very stylish um, empire phase uh, in, in French art over here. But uh, he roots it in, in this modern experience. And we can see, once again, that his work and, um, and his partner's work, Bill Christopher's work, uh, they influenced each other. Gypsy it here is about a, a decade before his, his partner painted this image of a reclining woman. So Bill, uh, I'm sorry, George Tucker comes back to this very theme about two decades later with a, a, another work called Gypsies. And here we've got two women. Um, they're, I would I, I, I would venture to say that they are African-American women. They look more like George Tucker's mature work. They're these rounded, solid forms here that he's built up with all of these very thin layers of tempera paint. Uh, we've got the seated woman with her arms crossed. She's looking directly out at us. In fact, we get this sense of a direct no nonsense confrontation that's happening here. And they're positioned very close to us in this shallow space in the foreground. And once again, there's this glowing curtain behind them. There's a figure, I'm assuming it's a male figure that's standing behind this curtain and his hands coming around the edge as though he is about to pull it aside. Now Tucker leaves us wondering about this shadowy presence here and what might happen next. But the same configuration comes up again and again in his work. So what happens next? He, um, the loft he was living in on West 18th Street has a fire. So he and Bill Christopher, they move to Brooklyn and in Brooklyn, they're living across the street from a boarding house. And this opportunity to see into the windows of this boarding house and see all of these different people kind of coming and going, just glimpsing their lives, inspires a whole series of window paintings, more than 10 of these paintings. So Tucker really liked this sort of natural framing device that a window presented. He loved kind of the visual eavesdropping of looking into somebody else's room. Um, and so what we see with this whole series is uh, a mix of races. Uh, a lot of these images have this kind of strong sensual quality to them. So in this picture, we see what looks like just an exhausted woman who's holding her head up here with her her other arm on the windowsill. And just behind her is this kind of glowing green shade here and the silhouette of a, of a shirtless man who's about to pull that shade aside. Notice how his arm here um, is echoes that same form of, of her arm over here. And George Tucker, who's laid out a grid, knows exactly that this is the center line of the painting right here at the, at the um, top of her head. Just beyond them, we see another shirtless man. We don't know what their relationship is. We don't know what's about to happen next. Will we be seen as the voyeurs in, in this image? Um, but we don't know. So let's just, before we move on, take an opportunity to appreciate these beautiful colors and how he's balanced these out so, 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 um, so wonderfully here. Now we started with this image. Um, 
this is called window two. It was actually done the same year. It's got all these familiar motifs. It's the male figure pulling the green curtain side. Now it's daylight. He's looking down, presumably outside and onto the street. And we've got this kind of pop of color here on the windowsill with the florals and the fruit um, and the wonderful kind of framing of his arm up like this, uh, similar to the window frame itself. And then our eyes discover this strange presence of this woman. I'm assuming it's a woman here who's kind of looking over this piece of furniture and she seems aware of us. What is otherwise just a lovely composition here turns into something um, that's slightly more disturbing, I would say. <laughs> now, sometimes uh, George Tucker gives us these intimate scenes. This is a painting called The Guitar from 1957. And it's uh, the opportunity to spot lovers through a window. So we have one lover sleeping, one lover who's uh, who has risen and he's sort of fingering the guitar here. Notice that the, the shape of the guitar echoes the shape of the woman's torso over here. And she is in, um, uh, well, we'll get to her pose a little bit later on in the program, but notice too this beautiful red ribbon that comes out over the edge of the windowsill. This is in art called a Trump Loy effect, a fool the eye effect. George Tucker's uh, uh, gallery representation said, keep painting those Trump Loy elements because that's what sells the paintings and that's what George Tucker wanted to do. So in, um, in this next and final image of, of windows here, we can see that George Tucker is going back to this idea of lovers standing at the window. And he loves this, this um, framing device of, of a figure with their arm bent over their head. He's not afraid to depict interracial couples or to suggest homosexual couples. He was just showing the world as it was, but this was done at a time when these kinds of relationships were typically conducted in the shadows or behind closed doors, or at least behind drawn wind, uh, window shades. So one last note about this homosexual picture here. Um, Tucker loved painting the male torso. Anytime he could get the chance, he would do this. Um, and art historians often compare these semi-nude pictures that he created to historical representations of St. Sebastian, who we see over here on the left. He was a Christian saint who was sentenced to death by a firing squad of archers. So he's often shown tied to a tree with arrows sticking out of his body. And St. Sebastian, um, is is usually shown with this idealized body. He's usually shown shirtless, and it's made him something of a guy, of a gay icon in the modern era. So the idea of suffering, sort of the slings and arrows of society, certainly resonates. And over the centuries, artists have always kind of made him a little bit erotic too, which has um, added to the appeal. So George Tucker is kind of building on this tradition um, with these interpretations of his works of art. So let's let's shift from windows to doors now. Um, George Tucker invited us in as voyeurs with his windows. When it comes to his doors, it's um, it's a different ap approach. In this painting from 1953, we see a series of these doors arranged very closely together. This was actually inspired by his own apartment at the time. We have a semi-nude woman who's walking out of one door. We don't really know what she's doing, where she's going. We can see the elements of another semi-nude figure it, through another door. And then this door here is just cracked open a little bit, allowing all this beautiful light into the hall way here. So it gets us thinking, you know, what is this building? What are these relationships? He only gives us little clues and it's really impossible to draw a conclusion. Now this painting has been compared very often to this great painting by the American artist Edward Hopper. This is called Rooms by the Sea and it was painted just two years before George Tucker's painting. It's another scene where the space is a little bit ambiguous. It's about light, it's about doorways. And, um, and George Tucker and Edward Hopper certainly knew each other. They ran in the same circles. So it could it's very possible that George Tucker kind of took a note from Hopper to create this picture of doors over here. Now doors sort of go in a different, darker direction for George Tucker. Um, windows provided this kind of visual access, but no physical connection. The doors we see kind of obscure, they shut out and they act as barriers between these figures. 
This is a picture called Voice One, and it shows these two almost identical men on either sides of the door, seemingly trying to communicate. He has his mouth open. He's pressed his ear to the door, attempting to listen. We get a sense of urgency, maybe even distress from this shadowy figure on the left, and we get sort of a quiet sense of alarm almost in this figure who's pressing his ear to the door. George Tooker keeps us wondering, what is the message? Doesn't it seem like the setup for a scary movie? Um, will it be a, a whisper? Will it be a cry? We don't know. But he goes back to the same composition here with uh, slightly different characters. This is voice two. It's at the National Academy of Design. Um, the image is a little bit more compressed. We've got African-American figures now. I would say the figure on the left in this picture looks a little bit more ghoulish, and the figure on the right certainly looks more fearful, but he's drained the rest of the color out of this. So what happens from here? You're hearing, you're hearing things through the door. Is it from yourself? Is it from a ghost? Is it from beyond the grave? What happens next? Well, George Tooker shows us what happens next. In this image over here on the left called The Door from 1970, we have a man who's forcing the door closed. He's like barricading it with his body. He doesn't want to hear the voices coming through the door, but with the sadness on his expression here, it's like the message has been delivered. He is, he's already internalized whatever is coming through that wall. In the image over here on the right, we have a figure who's now alone. He's holding himself in this shallow space. We don't know if he's hiding. Is he traumatized? It's like he is the figure that has become the ghost now because he's heard this voice. Now, as the years go on, the door paintings seem to become more about the division between life and death. This is a painting called The Lesson from 1974. And we have this pair of androgynous figures here on either side. And it seems like the door has now become a doorway to another world. It's the barrier between the living and the dead. So we have the living figure that's sort of cowering here, listening to this figure over here on the right, this kind of ghoulish figure with skeletal hands and this shriek on, on, their, on their face. So what is this lesson that is being imparted? Is it a lesson about death, about life, about their former self? Um, we have this arc of red in the foreground. I, I always interpret this as like a, an arrangement of like funeral flowers here, but, but you know, it's to anyone's interpre interpretation about what's happening. Now, um, just a few more paintings related to these doors. Uh, for George Tucker, these doors become human-sized boxes, and they become places of grief and isolation. We have over here on the left a painting called um, Woman at the Wall, and we can see almost this exact same figure over here on the right in a painting called Standing Figures. Once again, the built environment has become this infinite space with all of these uh, boxes uh, repeated uh, again and again and again. Is this George Tucker saying, this is what modern life is, compartmentalized and, and lonely? Or is this his vision of the afterlife? So we'll end our doors with whew, the natural progression to where these doors are going. It seems like a, a real organic evolution in some ways. The doors transform into tombstones. And once again, the space and the architecture of it is limitless. So with this image called Landscape with Figures 2 from 1966, we see the dead in their graves um, do they realize they're dead? They're, they're all awake in this moment. Um, there's this yellowy green light here, and we don't know if it's a moment of revelation or of resurrection. Either way, we know that Tooker has used this very simple concept of the separating wall um, in order to explore some of the most significant divisions of, of our lifetime. So let's turn to something lighter, shall we? <laughs> this is called the sections on light and love. We'll move through this pretty quickly. Uh, George Tucker had this remarkable ability to capture this kind of glowing light in his pictures. Um, and that's because of this luminosity of the tempera medium. This is 1953's jukebox. And we can see this exploration 
of light in the way that it especially illuminates this woman's face as she's kind of leaning languidly uh, against the jukebox. We have this wonderful crisscross pattern on this modern music making machine. And that is echoed in the twisting cray paper hanging from the ceiling. And despite this very festive decor here, it is a quiet scene, right? There's never anything really boisterous coming out of George Tucker. Now he turns his attention from electric light to the natural glow or uh, seemingly natural glow of these Japanese lanterns. He does a whole series on them. And once again, the tempera paint is really allowing that, that sense for, uh, or that his ability to conjure something that looks like it's glowing on the canvas. So, um, so this is called In the Summer House on the left. This is at the Smithsonian, and this is called The Garden Party on the, on the right. And once again, even though these are beautiful, you'd think sort of a lighthearted subject, there is um, this sense of quiet here, of solemnity. It's not necessarily joy, even uh, despite these, these um, beautiful lanterns. So one last lantern scene I'd like to share with you, along with a work by an artist that was deeply inspirational to George Tucker. This is a Baroque artist named Georges de la Tour. And you can see the, a clear relationship between their work. De la Tour was always interested in um, in light sources, in illuminating hands this way. Notice how the hands do something similar in both paintings and how head, heads are bowed in order to kind of resonate with this light on either side. Obviously, this is a depiction of the Christ child over here on the left. So it's a different subject matter, but the composition and that light is so similar. Now, and George Tucker also took up the subject of love and he expressed that in these beautiful paintings of these very deep and heartfelt embraces. So these are both paintings from the early 80s, Embrace 1 and Embrace 2. We've got the vertical orientation and the horizontal orientation just slightly different here. But these are figures that are set outside, and I don't think we've really seen that yet with his work. Um, we've got these beautiful rolling hills in the background, and the way these figures interlocked together, it's as though their bodies create another kind of natural formation in the land here. In both of these pictures, we don't see the man, his face. We just see this kind of relieved almost peaceful expression on the face of the woman. And I have to say, there's something about the way her head is oriented here that really reminds me of one of the most famous embraces in the history of art. And that is um, Gustav Klimt's The Kiss here. Notice how it's pretty, it's it's a pretty awkward angle for the head, but so I think he is, um, he's quoting that here. So just a few more of these gorgeous embraces from George Tucker. This is called Embrace Three from right around the same time. It's a little bit more stylized, a little bit more uh, abstracted. The lovers here are enveloped by this green fabric that becomes the landscape. It becomes that rolling hill. And their arms are wrapped around each other with their, with their hands pointing up. So it's as though he's cradling her head. She's cradling his back here. And the, the interlocking limbs just kind of create this swirling galaxy at the center of this picture. We cannot see her face, but there is this heartfelt earnestness in his, almost a sadness. We, we begin to wonder, is he overwhelmed in this moment or is he sad? Is, is this, does he know that this will be their last embrace? So even though Tooker takes this, um, this subject and he really runs with it, I'll show you just one more image of an embrace. In this case, the couple is now lying on the ground in the long grass. They are um, still enveloped by a blanket, as you can see here, and they're just holding each other so tightly. It's like two becomes one and they become one with the landscape too. Notice that the woman's hair really echoes the the um uh, the appearance of the grass here and the man's face is still that of this mixed emotion really sort of moved by this intense connection that they have so the figures lying on the ground here will take us easily right into our last section about sleep and death so this was um a subject that that George Tucker was always fascinated by this binary of sleep and wakefulness we kind of started with that today too consciousness and unconsciousness now we've already seen the guitar we saw the sleeping figure here 
And this, with your arm above your head, that is the art historical way, the, the artist way to show that somebody is sleeping and not dead. Because if they're just lying there with their eyes closed, they can very easily appear dead. The only way we know this figure over here, whose head rests on this white pillow, is sleeping and not dead, is that there is a nude woman in bed with them. Um, George Tucker makes it a little bit more ambiguous in other pictures. So this is uh, an image that is called Night One. And the line between sleep and death gets a little bit blurred here. It's that same sleeping head on a white pillow, but now there's somebody alongside them who is clothed, who's shrouded, who seems incredibly solemn in this moment. Um, so we are, we're sort of tasked with, with um, trying to figure out what is the nature of this relationship? Is this figure watching for something? Are they thinking or are they perhaps grieving? Now, Tucker sort of throws us for a loop with this next picture, which he actually calls sleepers. This is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. And of course, we see the familiar elements here, these, um, these heads that um, are sort of disembodied heads that are just surrounded by these white bed linens and pillows. Um, before this, they'd all had their eyes closed, but now there's a whole bunch of them. There's almost like a, an infinite sea of them, but now they all have their eyes open. And it's as though they're looking at something above them. Some of them seem to be in awe. Maybe some of them are a little bit alarmed by what they're looking at, but we don't know really what's happening here. If they're called sleepers, are they sharing a dream? Are they sharing a nightmare or is this the eternal sleep? Now, George Tucker, when he is focusing on death, he lets us know these are two images here called Meadow One and Meadow Two that show, uh, well, these are really reflections on the passing of the artist's mother. So we have um, a, 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 a deceased figure in both of these scenes and a man on his knees alongside her, um, just like with the embrace scenes that we saw before. This is set in a natural environment. So we have this sense that real true connection happens in nature, not in subterranean uh, subways or any place like that. But we see the man with his eyes cast downward and he is he's in mourning. Well, that familiar um, sort of motif of the disembodied head signals to us that this is a woman who has passed on. All right. So uh, the subject of death is one that has fascinated this artist since he was a young man. George Tucker actually painted this bizarre picture when he was just about 26 years old. It's called The Dance. And in The Dance, the, um, <laughs> the sidewalk has opened up here and death in multiple forms has emerged from the underworld. <laughs> he is there to torment people who are maybe not living um, very moral lives. Um, and, and really the other people in this sort of seedy part of town just go about their business. There are ladies of the night, there are sailors. Nobody else seems to notice that death is there. Now it, it's the word dance as a title is perfect because there is this wonderful kind of crisscross X shape that's happening with the extension of their, their limbs here. This is a little choreographed dance that, um, that George Tucker has designed design for death in this moment. Now, I want to draw your attention to this very disturbing woman over here in yellow who is facing us. Um, another, this is, uh, George Tucker includes all of these kind of haunting women who look directly out at us in his pictures. This woman though, I think seems to be one of the few people who's aware that death is there. You might be wondering about the floating paper here. And this is um, like newspaper that's been disturbed, but the only text on it is right Right here where George Tucker signed the picture. Now, I will admit to you now that I could not find a great um, color reproduction of this image. So this is a cropped version of what I could find, but a black and white version shows you that what has been cropped off. It's just this section over here. And this is a self-portrait of the artist. This is George Tucker just casually observing death from a distance. So, um, so he goes back to this subject of death and skulls again and again throughout his career. Um, he does a whole series about mirrors and this vanitas theme. And vanitas is um, 
it's well it's latin for vanity and it's a genre scene going back centuries where artists would sort of explore the brevity of life you know we're here for a short time by including these references these material references in their pictures that um that signal mortality, that signal death. So obviously a skull is, is a very uh, appropriate vanitas theme here. So in this picture, we have a young woman who's gazing into this oval handheld mirror. She's got some pearls in front of her. So she's thinking about her own beauty, but just behind her, there is a skull signifying to us and maybe her, maybe she's seen that skull in the mirror uh, that, that this beauty will in fact fade. It's, um, it's an unseen settling image and it's a lovely composition with this series of ovals here. He goes back to the mirror uh, once again. Um, this version here is called Mirror 4. We have a nearly identical young woman. In, in this case, she's got a rectangular mirror, and she's kind of looking at her reflection with a, a different expression here, maybe slightly scornful or judgmental, I'm not sure. But um, in this case, there's no skull. There's just this single red rose, and it's on the other side of her mirror. And from where we are, we can see that there are petals that have started to fall off of this rose. So once again, um, beauty will fade. Um, death is inevitable here. And the last of the mirror series that I wanted to share with you tonight is, um, is this one here where we have a new young woman. She's gazing into another rectangular mirror. That um, architecture in the background kind of reinforces the, the shape of that mirror. And, um, and she looks a, a, a little alarmed, right? Uh, her expression is somber because she's not just looking at her own reflection. She is most certainly looking at the reflection of the woman who's peering over her shoulder. Is it her mother? Is it her grandmother? Or is it just simply the specter of death? George Tucker leaves it up to us. But he also includes himself in the series. This is his own self-portrait from 1996. He's no longer casually observing death from a distance, as we saw in that earlier painting, The Dance. In this work, death has crept up right behind him. And even though he's smiling here, he looks a little bit ill at ease. Of course, death is just about to lay its bony hand on his shoulder, and maybe George Tucker is accepting this fate. So let's finish up really quickly with his legacy. Here are two um, photographs of the artist from later on in his life. Um, George Tucker died at the age of 90 due to kidney failure. He was in his home in Heartland of Vermont and it, um, he passed away in 2011. So over the course of this very long career that he had, believe it or not, he made less than 175 paintings. So that's what happens when you can only make about three or four paintings a year. But despite this, he had several major retrospectives during his lifetime um, at, at some uh, uh, major U.S. museums. And in 2007, as we can see over here, he received the prestigious National Medal of Arts. So just to wrap up on George Tucker and everything we've seen so far, we know him now as a an artist that used these kind of luminous colors to illustrate how people should act to each other and what happens when they don't act um, <laughs> the, the way they should, what those consequences look like. Tucker is an artist that pushed boundaries on topics that were important to him, including social justice and equality, but he often did that in his very understated ways. He remains, I think, one of the most distinctive, most underappreciated artists of the 20th century. So I will end there for now, and I welcome any uh, questions or comments you have about George Tucker. If he's a new artist to you, I would certainly love to hear what your what your reaction to his work uh, might be. So please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A. Jane, thank you for this talk. Um, these are some um, somewhat disturbing but um, intriguing images. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, um, how he was received by, by critics during his well, lifetime? I, so I mean, there is, um, there's a sense that it's like he was overlooked for the most part. Um, there were some very influential people that were helping his career along, um, notably a man named uh, uh, Lincoln Kirsten, who was a major player in, in New York City in terms of the arts. But, um, but 
I, I mean, he had works that were being acquired by museums during his lifetime, but he was kind of the subtitle or he was on like, you know, on the back page when, when abstract expressionists were on the front page. So it wasn't that anybody was, um, was really dismiss was outright dismissing his work. It was more that he just wasn't getting the same kind of attention. I think that was the biggest issue. Um, Jane asks, uh, where can you see the work locally? Because he was um, an alum of Phillips Academy, they have a great number of his works too. I have a couple of other museums here. The New Britain Museum of American Art has a great collection of his work. And then um, Dartmouth College, because he lived right up there and had the relationship with the school. Also the Columbus Museum of Art out in Ohio. They have some pretty significant collection. And then like you heard through the program, I mean, the Met has one, the Whitney has one, MoMA has a few, but, um, but I, I feel like those are just like little nods. It really has to be a museum focused on American art that has um, a good representation of his work. Um, Kathleen says, love this discussion. George Tucker has been a favorite of mine for years. Oh, that's great to hear, Kathleen. I'm glad you could join us tonight. It's been, it's been great to learn more about him and see some new images to me. Will you be publishing your research? Oh, well, you're very sweet to ask, but um, I am standing on the shoulders of the geniuses that really did a lot of the research here. So I just kind of pulled a lot of it together and sort of presented it through my own lens. I, I'm not sure if there's any really anything novel here, it's it's basically a synthesis of, of what's out there already. But Kathleen, you're very sweet to ask. So I, I appreciate that. Okay, any, and, oh, here's another question from Olga. Um, 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 Olga asked, what was his education and did he travel outside the US? Uh, he went to Harvard for undergrad and, um, and he wanted to paint while he was there, but he studied literature. And then he went to the Art Students League in New York City. And he had a really long um, relationship with them. Even while he was living in Vermont, he was commuting back to New York City to then teach at the Art Students League. So um, in terms of his travel, he did travel outside the US. I think he spent about I think he uh, took like a six month tour with um, with his first lover there, Paul Cadmus, and they went to the museums. They hit all the museums. They were both artists. They were so interested. They spent a lot of time in Italy. So if you're looking at some of these works and you're like, oh, this, this is like Botticelli, this is Piero del Francesca, it's because he internalized everything he saw. And I'm sure he brought a lot of books home. Um, Kathleen asks, what has prompted my interest? Um, how were you initially exposed to his work? And also, how did he wind up getting from Brooklyn to Andover? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, what prompted my interest is uh, someone in my family, although this has prompted all these interesting conversations in, in my immediate family growing up, somebody had bought a book on George Tucker's artwork. And honest to God, it was kicking around my parents' house for like 20 years. And nobody now remembers who bought the book, <laughs> but it's just a book where it's like, it, it's uh, the author was Thomas Garver, if I'm remembering correctly. And um, and I thought the images were just so compelling. So I, I mean, for years, I just flipped through this book, even as a teenager. And it's a little bit heartbreaking to go back to now because the book was published in the 90s and they were still referring to William Christopher, his his partner for, you know, 25 years or so as his friend, which is kind of sad. But um, uh, it, it, that was the book that galvanized me. Um, in, in terms of your follow-up question about how did he go from Brooklyn to Andover, his, I think his family moved to the suburbs when he was about six or seven years old. And I forget exactly offhand exactly where they moved, but um, clearly his parents uh, really prioritized his education. He only went to Andover for his last two years, so um, so then when he got into Harvard, it was like you must go to you must go to college, you must finish up. He did a lot of things when he was a young man because I think he wanted to please his parents. Um, Kathleen says, I have always seen his his work through the lens of Piero del Francesca. They both love the head look. <laughs> I would agree with that, Kathleen. Thanks for adding that. Um, wonderful. Okay, I think that is, oh, we just got another one. And a Cuban mother, a uh, half Cuban mother. But but that, that, that sense that he was like biracial um, was really important to him. And I think that probably formulated 
or, or was the foundation of why he was so open to other people and he and he welcomed the idea of interracial couples and that sort of thing at a time when most people weren't really that comfortable with it. Well, Jane, thank you so much for this fascinating talk tonight. Um, I'll remind people that um, Jane will be back August 9th, um, and that talk is Seaside Escapes, the Art and Architecture of the New England Coast. Um, I'll put uh, registration links in the follow-up email that I'll send out today or tom uh, tomorrow or the next day. Um, until then, Jane, um, thank you so much and have a good summer. Thank you so much, Sally. See you soon. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night.